Good evening, everybody. I'm Leslie Orbach, co-founder with Dr. Susan Cohen of the Remembering Eleanor Rathbone Group. And I want to welcome you all to the launch of the publication, Remembering Eleanor Rathbone, Mother of Child Benefit, on behalf of ourselves and Crossroads Women. This event is taking place just over 75 years since the first payment of the family allowance on the 6th of August, 1946. And you'll be sent a link to the publication after tonight's event. Susan and I set up the Remembering Eleanor Rathbone Group in 2015 to, commemor to commemorate the life and work of this remarkable woman. Amongst her many achievements, she was a suffragist, a feminist, a campaigner for social justice, the first female Liverpool councillor, independent MP and refugee activist. And of course, she was the driving force behind the long but ultimately successful campaign for mothers to be given a family allowance. During 2016, we held numerous events to, commemor to commemorate different aspects of her work in Liverpool, Oxford and London. And we were delighted to partner up with Crossroads Women to establish an oral history project. This has enabled us to record people's experiences of receiving the family allowance or child benefit or of their mothers or wives receiving it. We are extremely grateful to the National Heritage Lottery Fund and to the Eleanor Rathbone Trust for providing funding for this project and thank both organizations for their support. We would also like to thank all the volunteers who interviewed people and those who transcribed the interviews. We thank Parliament Hill School for their support at the start of the project and several of their school pupils were involved in the interviews. We thank the people from the community organisations in Liverpool and in London who arranged interviews for us and allowed us to use their premises. And most importantly, we thank all those who agreed to be interviewed, quite a number of whom are here tonight. In fact, our appreciation goes to anyone who helped support this project in any way, including Sam, Crystal and Eric, who are managing the technical aspects of tonight's event. We are honoured to, to have as our guest speakers, Baroness Lister, Emeritus Professor of Social Policy at Loughborough University, and Jenny Rathbone, Eleanor's great niece, who is the member of the Senedd of Cardiff Central. Two of the mothers who were interviewed for the project will be speaking, Maria Fulham from Liverpool and Shoda Rake from London. And you will be hearing brief excerpts from the historic parliamentary debates which preface the passing of the Family Allowance Act read by Charlotte Pike and Stephen Chapman. Finally, this project is a timely reminder that child poverty is not only still with us, but is rising, and the caring work of mothers and others remain undervalued. And now it gives me great pleasure to introduce Solvig Francis of Crossroads Women. Thank you, Leslie. Um, good evening, everyone. It's great so many are able to join this event to bring Eleanor Rathbone's legacy to the fore, to new generations of women. I'm Solvig Francis, part of Crossroads Women, the charity which runs the multiracial Crossroads Women's Centre going back to 1975. The Women's Centre, which houses several organisations, was started by the Wages for Housework campaign, which with Falling Wall Press Bristol, organized for Rathbone's classic, The Disinherited Family, to be republished in 1986. We were delighted when the Remembering Eleanor Rathbone group contacted us about the Oral History Project. I first heard about Eleanor Rathbone from Selma James, who in 1972, shortly after founding Wages for Housework, called together the Women's Family Allowance Campaign to stop the government taking family allowance from mothers and putting it in the men's pay packet. Just what Rathbone had successfully fought to prevent 
in 1945. Again, women were in uproar. And we found among the 148 women we interviewed, some who had been involved in that campaign, one of whom is speaking tonight. A beautiful poster from the Family Allowance Campaign in Liverpool is included in the publication we're launching tonight. And Selma and Nina Lopez were both involved in this project. Okay, firstly, what family allowance and child benefit meant to women? In our interviews, we asked mothers eight questions, starting with what the money meant for them. And I think Crystal is going to show us the page of the questions, is that possible? Just so you get a little taster of the book. It's almost impossible to overstate its importance and the dramatic change it brought overnight to the lives of women, children and men too, especially working class families, but not only. Mothers in better off households also often did not have money of their own. Again and again, we heard how close to the edge women were and are living and how life-saving what a godsend this money was and still is. Some comments. I remember picking up my family allowance without a penny in my purse. Without it, sometimes you couldn't live. A savior, because your income support goes very quick. You are always waiting for it. Family allowance in 1946 brought about an immediate increase in the standard of living of working class families with two or more children. Five shillings per child came into the hands of the mother every week, representing at the time something like a 10% increase in the household income. That's assuming the main breadwinner, usually the man, had a regular wage. But women told us, too often family allowance was the only money. When the father was a casual laborer, on piecework, lost his job, on strike, sick, when his low wages ran out midweek, when he was mean and spent his wages only on himself. I never got a penny off him, one woman said. For single mothers especially, it could be the only money or supplemented low benefits or small wages. Women referred to the unfairness of getting lower wages than men. And very true for immigrant mothers. We interviewed several who had come from the Caribbean and Africa in the 60s and 70s. They experienced the lowest wages and their husbands unable to find a job. As one said, it was our day-to-day -day income. Men were appreciative too. Without it, we would have been in trouble, said a 93-year-old father of three and several women reported that their husbands were only too pleased that the family had this extra money coming in. The financial independence and control it gave mothers was crucial for survival, stability, and opening up options. The security of that money was priceless, said one. Several commented it boosted their confidence and morale. Because this money was earmarked for mothers, they felt they were being considered and deserved it. It meant their children mattered. It helped relationships. One woman said she felt better in the marriage as she was contributing financially. And several said the money enabled them to choose to work fewer hours or be full-time mothers for a while. I didn't want to miss all the bits and pieces. I was able to give a lot of security by being pr present. How mothers spent the money. In short, it fed and clothed generations of children after 1946. It meant that children, but often the whole family ate. The most common answer women gave was food, followed by shoes and clothing. But it helped with rent, bills, birthday, Christmas presents, filling in when the husband failed to pay the rent to pay what he was responsible for. Some were able to open a savings account for their children or save for bigger items like a computer for schoolwork. 
most women told us they could never save. The money was crucial for women to escape violent or just unhappy marriages. One woman built up a nest egg till she had enough to leave. Another bit by bit bought household items, stored at a friend's until ready to move. And sons and daughters remembered the joy of family allowance or child benefit day. Meals would improve, there might be a treat. Another was impressed by the long queues. The money was so badly needed, mothers couldn't delay getting it and go on a quieter day. But it was also women's gathering point to catch and talk about things going on in the world. And when women were asked what they would have done without the money, in various ways, women said it would have been a much bigger struggle without this money. And one pointed out, a lot of our, more of us would have gone on the game and sooner. The fundamental purpose of Rathbone's family allowance was that it be paid to the mother. And we'll hear later more about the fight to ensure that mothers got that money, which she won. We asked women what their husbands and partners thought about that. The majority agreed with that. The money can only be safeguarded in the hands of the mother. The mother knew exactly what was needed, but also, but, all, but was also doing the main work of bringing up children. One woman told us a mother always sees about her children first. A payment to the mother was revolutionary. Women recalled that at first, a lot of men objected to the wives having any money at all. And irresponsible men came in for a severe drubbing. We wouldn't have seen a penny if it had gone to him. My husband gambled his wage. Mothers won't see their kids starve. Husbands would. And we heard stories of men trying to get their hands on that money. Happily, several had appreciative partners. He knows it was for food. I had a good husband, but had to add, I was lucky. I must say that the men we interviewed for the project, husbands and sons, were fully thought supportive and thought mothers were entitled to a lot more. Asked whether child benefit should be means tested or a universal payment to all mothers regardless of income, which Rathbone boldly fought for and won, most were against means testing, especially mothers, because as one said, it was important to recognize the work of childbearing and rearing. There was concern for the stigma of means testing that some would miss out causing more injustice and suffering. Several working class women pointed out that you don't know what goes on behind closed doors of wealthier households. Everyone seemed to know of someone whose well-paid husband kept his wife short. Some supported means, tested, means testing, but wanted lower income to get more. And asked whether mother's caring work gets the recognition it deserves, financially or otherwise, most gave an emphatic no. Mothers felt no one noticed what they did 24 seven, yet it was their most important job. A few felt it was a personal choice to have children, not a government responsibility, and that men were now picking up the slack a bit more, so things were better. Older women in particular lamented the pressure on both parents to work full time to the detriment of children and on single mothers to be pushed off benefits to get a job. There was a serious consideration of payment for mothers as Rathbone advocated. Some worried about how to finance that, but one father pointed out, it's not that expensive compared to some of the things the country pays for. Women made the case that Rathbone made decades ago, that we and our children desperately need this money in mother's hands, that we are entitled to it by our work, commitment, 
and devotion and that governments have to listen. Child benefit and Rathbone's principles of universality have been under attack in the past decades. Asylum seekers can no longer claim it. Households with incomes over 50,000 are means tested. The benefit cap setting a ceiling on how much benefit a family can receive includes child benefit, which means that the most impoverished mothers with the most children lose out most. Shockingly, very few people we interviewed knew about Eleanor Rathbone, though more did in Liverpool. Some called it Ellie's money. But when mothers heard about what Rathbone did, they were full of heartfelt praise. Thank God for that woman. And in awe that someone had such a deep appreciation of their troubles and contribution to society. It's hard to do justice to all that the mothers, fathers, daughters, and sons conveyed over many hours of interviews. There is a lot to be learned from their experiences and insights. We hope that a time when, at a time when many sectors are uncovering their history, this publication will help us reclaim Eleanor Rathbone's and family allowance as a crucial part of women's history and that it provokes discussion and helps bring more recognition of what mothers are entitled to, a share in the wealth of a community which depends on them for its very existence, as Eleanor Rathbone said in the disinherited family. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Solvig, for that excellent and really thorough summary of, of the findings of the project. And I'm now delighted to introduce Baroness Lisper, Emeritus Professor of Social Policy at Loughborough University. Thanks, Leslie, and please do call me Ruth, not Baroness. <laughs> I just don't think we've got space for Baronesses around here. Um, I, I'm really, really pleased to be part of this event. Um, I, I was asked to talk about child poverty, which I will, but I think really just about everything I've got to say has already been said through the quotes through, and I'm really looking forward to reading all of the quotes because I think they're just brilliant. Um, and it's great to be part of this because Eleanor Rathbone has been an inspiration to me, uh, both through my work at the Child Poverty Action Group, but also at the very first public academic lecture I gave was the Eleanor Rathbone, Memor Eleanor Rathbone Memorial Lecture. Um, and that kind of opened up a whole lot of things for me in terms of women's citizenship and so forth. So, so thank you for the invitation. As I said, I was asked to speak about child poverty. As Leslie said, uh, it's on the increase. It's increased by about 700,000 over the last decade, up four percentage points. And there are now nearly a third of all children living in poverty. And it's so, so disappointing because whatever you thought of the last Labour government, and I was pretty critical of it in many ways, they did manage to reduce child poverty significantly and they showed that it can be done. But nearly all the good that was done has been undone in the subsequent decade. What I think is particularly worrying is the worsening of what is, is being called deep poverty. Those who are living way below the poverty line, sometimes in, in actual destitution. Uh, and it's particularly um, research has shown from Leeds University that particularly at risk of children from black and minoritized communities. Um, and a key driver in both the increase in poverty, but particularly in deep poverty, has been the freezing and cuts in the real value of social security benefits, including child benefit, and a series of punitive reforms um, that have hit children especially hard. Um, Solvig mentioned the, the benefit cap, um, and there's also the two-child limit. Well, now the two-child limit doesn't affect child benefit, although sometimes people think it does. And I think it's quite significant that it doesn't because the, I think there were, there were rumors that, it, that they were looking to include child benefit, and I think they realized that if they'd included child benefit, 
that might have just been a step too far in terms of you know pub, what the public thought about it whereas unfortunately the evidence suggests that the public is quite happy for um, the two child limit to be put on on universal credit um, and the Im the impact it shows up I think particularly in terms of the numbers in deep poverty because if you think about it, many of those hit by the cuts in Social Security over the past decade were already in poverty. So it doesn't show up in the, the total numbers in poverty if the, the, the effect of the cuts, but what it's doing is pushing particularly families of children further below the poverty line. Um, now, during the pandemic, uh, the 20 pounds uplift to university, universal credit help mitigate some of uh, that, of what, what's been happening. But the 20 pounds was the same, regardless of whether there were children or not. So you, for families of children, they had to stretch that 20 pounds that much further. And of course, people on legacy and related benefits, particularly disabled people, didn't benefit from the uplift. And as everybody knows, I'm sure on this call, um, the 20 pounds has now been withdrawn and uh, it's only the withdrawal is only partially mitigated by the improvements to universal credit for those in work that were announced in the budget so what we're what all the organizations that work in this area the think tanks the roundtree foundation and so forth are saying that it's going to push more children into poverty and it's going to push more children further below the poverty line now and again, I'm sure, and again, it came out, I think, in some of the quotes, child poverty and mother's poverty are closely linked. Uh, there are two key factors here. The first, in particular, I think that Eleanor Rathbone brought out so well in her writings and, and, and what she said in Parliament, that stems from mother's role, um, caring for children, managing poverty, uh, mothers are all too often the shock absorbers of poverty, um, and they, that that and they try and do their best to shield their children from the full impact of poverty, um, both the material effects of poverty, but also what are sometimes called the psychosocial effects, the the shame, the stigma that, that we've heard about um, that children and young people can feel particularly keenly uh, when their, their sort of identities are developing. Um, and it's hard work, very hard work, uh, and it can take a real toll in terms of both physical and mental health. And then also uh, the implications of ch children for women's labour market position, because uh, child poverty is much more likely to be in, in two parent families uh, if one parent isn't able to work full time, then that increases the likelihood of child poverty. And of course, for lone mothers, um, trying to juggle looking after children and being in the labour market is, is incredibly difficult. So in terms of the role of child benefit, um, decent family allowances, child benefit, have always been central, a central demand of the Child Poverty Action Group. As I said, I worked there for quite a while. You might be able to see on my wall behind me a poster, which is a poster of the Labour Party poster of Child Benefit, um, introduced 6th of August 1946, as has been said. And I love that poster um, because it, it just brings home how important and, and kind of uh, that the, the child benefit, and that was given to me when I was at CPOG. I think it was some anniversary that, of my time there. But um, anyway, I've always always keep that behind me. Uh, and it, and the reason I think, and again, it came out so well in the quotes that you've um, from the from the study, that CPOG sees child benefit uh, and well, family allowance now child benefit as absolutely critical to not just alleviating poverty, but preventing poverty um, and or helping to prevent poverty. And that includes the hidden poverty that we've heard about when income isn't shared fairly within the family. And Eleanor Rathbone did so, I mean, was way ahead of her time, really, in terms of understanding that and really 
bringing that home to people um, that income often is not shared fairly and that both in poorer households and in better off uh, households. Um, and that is one of the reasons why means tested support is not always going to do what it says on the tin. It isn't going to target help on those in greatest need necessarily, but also child benefit avoids a whole lot of other of the problems associated with means testing, low pay cut, uh, the poverty trap when you, you, you earn and then you lose your money as, as you get more, as you earn more. Um, it's divisive, the stigma that we've heard about, um, all that. Um, and also, and I think this is incredibly important, and again, it came out in the quotes, but I think it, it's taking on an, a, a different kind of importance, that, and that is the security that mothers in particular get from receiving child benefit, because it's there, they know it's there, it's not subject to sanctions, it's not subject to the ver vagaries of means testing, um, and at a time of, it, it, so it's, I think it's really, really important in terms of having that to, to, to fall back on, as we've heard. And um, it's, it, it, it's, I think, particularly important at a time when there's so much economic insecurity, insecurity in the labour market, we've got family instability, we've got the impact of domestic violence, and child benefit is kind of um, a rock you know, that, that, that mothers can hold on to. Um, and certainly I know CPAG have said that they've quite, you know, come across a number of mothers now, we're not talking historically, we're talking now, who says that it's, you know, when the universal credit's gone wrong, you know, it's not been paid or um, you've lost the money through sanctions or whatever, having that child benefit is absolutely crucial uh, in terms of providing an element of security. Um, it's important too, I think, in terms of in-work poverty, which is, has been in is soaring in recent years. Uh, and this is another really important lesson from Eleanor Rathbone was that wages cannot and should not take account of family size. Therefore, you have to have the state supporting families. And that is best done through a non-means tested child benefit, because when you when you do it through means testing, the danger is then you subsidize low pay and child benefit doesn't do that. So again, it's an argument for why child benefit is so important in addressing poverty. So um, all in all, uh, I mean, my conclusion, and it's really what, what was what's come out of the more historical material is that decent child benefit has to be a key part of any strategy to uh, bring down child poverty. And I'll leave it at that, thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Ruth. And I'd already was going to call you Ruth at this point. Um, as, as usual, a really um, incisive analysis of this current situation. And I'd now I'm really happy and pleased to welcome Jenny Rathbone, Eleanor's great niece, who is also a member of the Senate for Cardiff Central. Thank you, Jenny. Oh, well, thank you very much for um, inviting me. And uh, uh, the, um, the publication looks fantastic and I really look forward to reading it. Um, I think I'll, I'll just say a little bit about the context in which um, Eleanor was operating because she was she was born in the Victorian era when women didn't have the franchise and, and she because she came from a very political family um, all the on the men's side uh, she decided that she was uh, going to um, seize the moment and uh, so she became the first uh, woman councillor um, in Liverpool and it was really that experience. Uh, in Liverpool during the First World War that um, got her really thinking about family allowances because um, when all these men joined up uh, and went off to the trenches, um, the families were left completely destitute. Nobody had thought about, nobody in government had thought about the impact on the families who suddenly had no wage earner. 
And um, of course, whatever the soldiers got in the way of pay um, took no account of uh, the number of uh, children or people in their families that they had previously been supporting. And so suddenly um, the the government realized they had to do something about this because otherwise there would have been riots. Um, And so Eleanor took on the task of um, delivering um, relief to all the uh, families in Liverpool who'd been affected by uh, the men going to war. It it was really the modern equivalent of a food bank in some respects. but it was an incredibly important uh, thing for those families. And that got her on the road of thinking really hard about why it was um, that women and families had no money, even though women were doing such a, an important job looking after the next generation. Um, so obviously she, she was a very determined person. Uh, she had um, private money to enable her to campaign for 30 years for family allowances. Um, but it was really her persistence, um, as well as the observations from the research she did, which was, you know, really um, some of the first uh, social research that's ever been done, uh, looking into the pay of dock workers, looking into uh, the case um, that the uh, miners had for getting increased pay. Um, and. Uh, of course, nothing much has changed. Today is Equal Pay Day, the day on which women work for nothing from that between now and the end of the year because of the way in which uh, women's pay is discriminated uh, against because it, the assumption is that we all have children and therefore we aren't as important as men. And, you know, it, we're still a very long way from where we need to be. And all of this is really relevant to um, today's crisis. Um, Ruth has already um, alluded to the fact there's been such a a significant increase in child poverty, but all the other things that uh, are coming down the road, the the new technology that will um, take on uh, the, the roles that people are currently paid for, you know, what is that going to lead to? Is that going to lead to more time for caring, uh, more time for leisure, or is it going to lead to even more um, poverty and inequality in society where some people have work and others have no work? Um, So we we really do have to champion the cause of everybody in society, including those um, who have are the victims of society that you know the the inadequacy of um the decisions made by adults uh, particularly me- those made by men um i uh, i'm involved at the moment in uh, a campaign to get um, free school meals for all children because of the extent of um the um the food and fuel poverty that families are suffering in such large numbers Um, So there are huge choices uh, facing us uh, as we grapple with uh, the consequences of Brexit, the climate emergency and uh, COVID. Um, And we have to fight for um, a more just society um, now and uh, indeed for the future of our planet. I mean, it is that um, straightforward. Happy to answer any questions or or say a great deal more, but uh, there are so many people on this call who know uh, so much about Eleanor Rathbone that um, I, um, you know, I I think it's uh, wonderful that you've kept the flame alive of um, Eleanor's work. Thank you very much indeed, Jenny, for um, this, not only the historical information about Eleanor's involvement in this issue, but also the connection today to the situation today. So thank you very much indeed. Um, We're now going to hear from two of the mothers who were interviewed during the project, Maria Fulham from Liverpool and Shoda Raquel from London. Thank you. Hello, good evening, everyone. Um, As the mother of four children that I breastfed, I've always found child benefit extremely helpful in the early months. Um, It allowed me to buy anything that may have been needed quickly for my child. 
and before maternity was paid into my account or my family's weekly wage went into the family budget, um, this, this helped as a stopgap. It helped to bridge the beginning of the week to the end of the week and enabled me to contribute to the family expenses. As my children grew older, I worked part-time and it was one of the financial reliable supports that I was entitled to from the government that was not means tested or questioned and allowed me to buy a children's jumper if urgently needed or buy a meal or a treat for them or use that money for an ex um, travel expenses for a trip to visit a friend or a dentist or even attend an interview. It's definitely made a difference to all our lives and my children will probably remember some of the small treats that they were given during the week as I, were, I do by my mother. This can all be attributed to the extraordinary woman, Eleanor Rathbun, that campaigned for this financial payment to be given to mothers and or caregivers in their efforts to raise children. I'm delighted that I was able to take part in this project, highlighting the situation of mothers and children, and very grateful to all those mothers that I interviewed and, shared their, and who shared their memories with me. A big thank you to all of those women. And a big thank you to Anna Rathbone and her instigation of this wonderful child benefit that mothers so need and I still use today. Thank you. Okay. First of all, thank you very much indeed, Shoda. Um, and we're now going to hear excerpts from the parliamentary debates that prefaced the introduction of the family allowance and welcome Solvig Francis, Charlotte Pike and Stephen Chapman. Okay, in um, April 1941, Eleanor Rathbone and Wing Commander John Allen Cecil Wright, MP for Birmingham, Erdington, put forward a motion which was then signed by over 200 MPs, that this house would welcome the introduction of a national state paid scheme of allowances for dependent children, payable to their mothers or acting guardians, as a means of safeguarding the health and well-being of the rising generation. This House urges His Majesty's Government to give immediate consideration to the formulation of such a scheme. By 1945, to save money while retaining the universal principle, Rathbone had had to agree that family allowance would not be paid for the first child, and the amount was much less than she wanted. But she stressed that it was of immense importance that it should be paid to the mother. Officials and ministers fought this premise to the bitter end, and the Family Allowances Bill, published in February 1945, stated that the mother money would belong to the father. On 8th of March 1945, Rathbone threatened to withdraw her support, and most MPs backed her. So, um, yeah, the Minister of National Insurance, Sir William Jowett. The conclusion that we have come to in the bill is that the money should belong to the father, but that either parent should be able to encash it. That has this merit, that it enables the normal family to decide for themselves what they want to do. And it really will not matter very much in a happy family what is done. After all, the father is generally the breadwinner. The husband is the spouse who is primarily liable for the maintenance of the child. Miss Rathbone, Combined English Universities. I have always considered the fundamental injustice of excluding children from all share of their own and the national income, although children and their mothers together constitute between one third and one half of the entire population. Family Allowance recognises that they have a claim to payment of money from the state. Yet this recognition comes in so strange a form that it seems actually to contradict rather than to affirm that very principle. The proposal, in the way it is stated in the bill, will not raise the status of motherhood, but will actually lower it. In the words of the bill, where the man and wife are living together, the allowance will belong to the man. The great majority of fathers are, no doubt, kindly, responsible men and have responsible, decent wives. 
But suppose we consider the proportion of husbands in the case of whom difficulty may arise. Among the minority will be greedy or selfish men who will hold on to the money. It was not a stroke of Machiavellian policy to degrade the status of motherhood, but the cabinet is composed of men and they cannot be expected to realize how women think on this question. I want to warn them of the intensity of women's feelings about it. I took part in that long bitter struggle for the women's vote before the last war. We did not grudge all that it cost us because it was worth it. And we got full realization of women's citizenship through it. But I do not want to go through all that again. It was a bitter struggle and it caused very ugly results. Do not force us back into what we thought we had done with, an era of sex antagonism. If the bill goes through in its present form, I cannot vote for the third reading. Although I have worked for this thing for over 25 years, it would be one of the bitterest disappointments of my political life if the bill did not go through. But I foresee too well the consequences if it goes through in a form which practically throws an insult in the faces of those to whom the country owes most. Group Captain Wright. I wholeheartedly support payments to the mother. Obviously, the mother, as the person who has to do the work in connection with her child, should receive this allowance. It is also a great pity to suggest that because a man is the person who actually earns the money, he should be given the complete powers of dictatorship which the ownership of the money bags must bring him. I look upon this matter as fundamental. The ultimate benefits of family allowances will accrue to the nation rather than to the individual. And for this reason, therefore, the cost should be borne by the state. Dr. Edith Summerskill, Fulham West. One has to be a woman who is humiliated week by week when she has to ask her husband for money for necessities. Therefore, I say that a contribution of this kind, even of five shillings a week, will enhance the status of the mother who is, in my opinion, the most important person in the country, for she produces the potential workers. This is the first opportunity that the house has had of recognizing the services which the mother gives to the home. And I ask the minister to take full advantage of that opportunity. Sir William Beveridge. I welcome the decision of the government to leave the question of whether the payment shall be made to the mother or father to a free vote of the house. I shall vote for payment to be made to the mother. This allowance is money given for a purpose, for the purpose of seeing that the children of this country, so far as possible, are properly fed, clothed and housed. Money for that purpose should naturally be given to the mother as the person who in 99 homes out of 100 has to spend for that purpose. The children's cash allowance should be paid to the mother as money for providing school meals is to be given to those who are to provide and organize the meals. I think the government made a mistake in chronology. They did not realize that it was, this was 1945. They thought we were back in the year 1879, the year in which I was born, and in which before the Married Women's Property Act, all money belonged to the husband. Thus, they thought that this money should belong to the father. I am delighted that the government are going to allow the House to bring them forward from 1879 to 1945. I suggest that if a child is allowed to live in this country, it ought to get the benefit of this allowance so as not to be in want. The test should not be, be not nationality, not even domicile, but residence. This is Eleanor Rathbone again, after um, the bill being passed on the 11th of June 1945. This is what Rathbone said and how she was congratulated. 
It is naturally a very great joy for me to see the end of the first stage in this fight, because I do want to make it clear, although it might seem rather ungracious when somebody is being congratulated upon her baby to point out the defects in the baby. Yet I feel I must point out that this baby is a very little one. We feel that it will have to be a good deal fattened and cosseted before it reaches its proper stature. To point out its defects, the whole thing is on too small a scale. There are many other respects in which we feel that this bill, this act, as we shall soon be able to call it, will have to be a bigger act before it does its work. Viscountess Aster. When family allowances were first mooted, people on this side of the house said that it would break up the home and the Labour Party and the trade unions would not have them at all. We have come a great way since then and all because of one revolutionary woman. It is very difficult when we look at the Honourable Lady, the member for the English universities, Miss Rathbone, to think of her as a revolutionary, but she is, and it is her work and her vision and courage that have really brought us where we are today. Thank you so much, both Charlotte and Stephen, for this for excellent rendition of just a really very few examples of the fantastic parliamentary debates around this issue. I really recommend people look at Hansard and read them because and you'll, you'll get more examples of excerpts in the flip book. But thank you both very, very much indeed. It was fantastic. Yes. So thank you very much, Maria. I'm very pleased to welcome you to talk about your experiences. I first came into contact regarding the family allowance. I was only a child, about, about 10 years of age, when one of the local councillors and had a loudspeaker and was going around with a, like a kind of a petition. So we as children, he gave us a penny and we were knocking on the doors to get the people to sign for it. Didn't have a clue what it was all about. But then as I grew up and realised what the family allowance meant to people, and then when I got married myself and realised, you know, what it had that income, because a lot of people, their husbands get their wages and they drank them. And the mother got, would get what was ever left by the time he come home from the pub. So having that family allowance of their own meant that at least they had some income coming in to feed the children. And in some cases, to help pay the rent. You didn't get anything for the first child. You only got it for the second and any other children after that. Later on, it was adjusted. So people now get it for the first child. As a matter of fact, I think now they get more for the first child than they do for the second and third but it does make a hell of a difference to all mothers and it should never be taken away or should not be included in any other benefits. It should be separate and not attached to universal credit or anything like that because it makes a lot of difference to a woman to at least have some money of her own. Thank you. <laughs> Maria, thank you so, so much indeed um, for that for that and thanks again to Shoda and I'd now like to introduce we're now going to play a short recording and you'll hear Eleanor Rathbone's voice um, in a speech that she gave. These feminist reforms are not I think what we enfranchised women prize most highly. We care even more for the opportunities our citizenship gives us of taking a full part in the life of our nation. But in, doing, but in doing our feminist work, we acquired an expertise which many of us have applied successfully in other works of life. It wasn't only that we learned to, use the uses, uh, to, uh, to know the uses and limitations of private members' legislation better than most members of Parliament know them. We also perfected ourselves in the art of the political agitator. We learned when to be tactfully per persuasive and when to give the rein to our justified impatience. We learned the necessity of compromise and of concentrating our practical efforts 
on the best obtainable rather than the ideal best. And above all, we learnt the lesson that in this hard world, those who want to get things done must not be afraid of unpopularity and of the reputation of fanaticism. Yeah, 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 yeah. Study the history of great reforms and find me, if you can, one which has been achieved solely by sweet reasonableness and appeal to justice. Re reasonable argument there must always be, but there must also be the passion of conviction and the fire of enthusiasm. It's been the good fortune of the women's movement to have had among its readers and its rank and file many women who combine these attributes of reason and of passion. I'm now really delighted to pass over to my colleague Susan, who is going to be um, managing questions and answers. But can I take the opportunity to thank everybody who's participated in this evening's event um, and made it really a fantastic event, a fantastic launch to a very important project. So thank you. So Susan. Thank you, Leslie. Well, I mean, that's been such a tour de force. It's been absolutely incredible. I hope everybody's enjoyed it as much as I have. And I've been a bit, bit more of a backseat to this than the other. So I really have to thank everybody very much indeed. I actually, there's a f I've got a lack of questions. We've got quite a few comments. I don't know whether people have been following them in the chat box. Um, Claire's talking about shockingly mummies relying on child benefit to feed f uh, families while waiting for universal credit to come in, which Ruth drew attention to and which we know about. Uh, it's I'm very pleased that this has introduced people who knew nothing about Eleanor Rathbone to her work, which Damien has pointed out. And let's have a look and see what else we've got here. I'm sure somebody must, people must have some questions they can put to us. I mean, when I did all my research on Eleanor Rathbone, which goes back to about 2000, most of my work was actually in connection with her work for refugees, but you can't disassociate that work from everything that came before it. And it all, I always found it so remarkable that for somebody in Eleanor's position, because she was an unmarried lady, um, as Jenny pointed out, she was born in the Victorian era. She had, uh, although she had a privileged lifestyle in so far as she was, uh, she came from a comfortably off family, she didn't take any of that for granted. And she used her financial position to enable her to help people who were unable to help themselves. And she was, a completely, a totally remarkable woman. I would like to know a little bit more about her life, because I, I don't know anything about her life. And um, when did she get um, into Parliament, actually? Was it in 1918? Or, and um, I think she represented the universities. Was she a graduate? I'd like to know a bit more about her. I saw Jenny putting her hand up. So if you unmute, Jenny, I'm delighted for you to come okay. back. Well, thank you for that question. Um, she did go to university it's in Oxford. Um, she went to Somerville University. But at the time, women weren't allowed to get full degrees. So although she did um, sit uh, the exams, uh, she had to pay somebody to transcribe her terrible handwriting. Uh, because the examiners otherwise wouldn't have read it. But um, she never got a full degree because at that time women were considered second order individuals. She did stand um, in an earlier um, election um, and others will remind me what when that was. So that was in Liverpool, um, but it was just um, too much uh, for the uh, reactionary men of Liverpool to, to want to vote her in. And of course she, she refused, uh, her family were all liberals historically, her father, grandfather, etc. But it was sort of too much to, for her, I think, ideologically to join the Labour Party, which was a little bit sort of not quite uh, where she uh, was felt she was at. Um, so it was really only the opportunity to stand in the university's seat that, uh, which existed until, um, after her death um, that enabled her to get elected. I think it was incredibly difficult for women to get elected and even more so if you didn't have a political party behind you, which 
was a little bit different in those university seats. Maybe we could move on to Marjorie. Have you got a question, Marjorie, you'd like to put? You could unmute, please. Well, it, it's more just sharing that I'm, I was married at 16 in, with my first marriage in 1970. My husband had a good wage as a welder, but I was still grateful of that family allowance. It used to come in a book. And I can remember saving up for, the, for a tumble dryer because I, get, I got fed up of drying the nappies around the fire. Mm -hmm. And you're making me remember when I went to the Yorkshire Electric Board to, to purchase a tumble dryer, they were saying I had to have permission from my husband. And I said, I have got the cash here. I expect some discount. And could you deliver it in the next two days? <laughs> so we, and I got my tumbler dryer. And I was the first on the street with a tumble dryer. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely wonderful. Kaleshi, are you unmuted now? Would you like to come in? Yes. Thank yes, you. Please. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, I just wanted to like, there was a lady uh, uh, that was talking about um, the marginalized um, group, the Black and my, um, ethnic minority, um, about how they have been margin marginalized based on getting a um, family allowance. So I want to find out, I, I want to ask what has been put in place to make sure that even when we, we, we saw, uh, resolve the issue of family allowance, what has been put in place to ensure that they get, they will be, it, what's the word? It's like to ensure that they get the family allowance that can, they can use to look after their children. I don't know if, if you understand what I mean. It was to bridge the gap. It's like something that has been put in place to bridge the gap between the black and ethnic minority. Um, is there somebody there, Jenny? Might you be able to answer that? Uh, or what about Ruth or, or oh, Ruth? <laughs> yes, perhaps Ruth, you could come back on that question. Um, I'm not quite sure uh, what you mean. Um, I can't remember who spoke about it now. I, I certainly mentioned that children in black and minoritized families are particularly yes. at risk yes. of, yes. of deep child poverty. Um, yes. And the, I think one reason for that is that, I mean, it doesn't apply for all my minoritized groups, but the, they're more likely to be in larger families. And mm -hmm. because the benefit cap, which um, I think Solvig talked about, and two-child limit on universal credit, uh, particularly hit larger families. So, I mean, there isn't, I mean, unfortunately, I mean, in a sense, there's nothing then to protect this group because they, you know, one might say, well, you know, you can turn to universal credit, but if universal credit itself is in effect discriminating against larger families, it's indirectly discriminating against minority groups. Um, uh, a point that has been made, but has not been kind of successful. So it, it's, and then there's, a, I think somebody, I can't remember who talked about the position of asylum seekers um, and those without recourse to public funds who um, are really vulnerable to destitution. Uh, and in theory, if you're destitute, you should be able to get some money. But I mean, proving you're destitute is no easy matter. No, they have, no. as a temporary concession, provided free school meals for some families without recourse to public funds during the pandemic. And there is an, in an invest, they, they are looking at the longer term on this, but they've been looking at it for, well over a year and in fact I asked a question yesterday in the House of Lords about it and got I mean an answer to a completely different question I mean that's what happens sometimes you ask a question the minister has been briefed thinking you know they had free school meals so they asked answered something completely different so I'm none the wiser about what's happening about uh, families without recourse to public funds but there's a growing um, concern I think among um, groups uh, who um, uh, uh, 
refugee group organizations that work for refugees and, and asylum seekers about this impact of no recourse to public funds. And I think what's beginning, and I think one of the problems in this country has been, has been a sort of separation between the so-called poverty lobby, those campaigning around child poverty, poverty generally, and those campaigning for the rights of refugees and asylum seekers. And I think it's really important that they come together uh, because this is a group particularly vulnerable to destitution. Thank you. More to say. Thank you, Ruth. Um, we have a question from Emily Burnham. Emily, could you unmute yourself, please? Thank you. Hello. Hi. Um, the absolutely fantastic presentation, everyone. Really looking forward to reading the book. And um, thank you for your comments just now, Ruth, as well, because I work with Women Against Rape um, with asylum seekers. I've, uh, this, um, this particular question um, is about the, uh, the fact that the child protection also led to what was called home responsibility protection, which protected women's pension rights. And so I'm a mum with three children and I have the right to a state pension um, up until my child, I'm collecting credits towards my state pension up until my child is 12, as long as I'm able to claim child benefit. Um, some of my friends who have higher um, husbands with sort of higher paying jobs and are no longer entitled to child benefit are, um, are not um, going to be getting their pension rights. They're going to be losing out on their pension rights unless they go through what I think are quite a lot of steps to make sure that they claim they claim it and then it's taken away again and this kind of thing and a lot of people I know are not aware of these issues and what it means I had a quick look up about it but I see that in there was a report and in 2015 there was 5,000 sorry um, 500,000 um, families had renounced child benefit weren't claiming it at all anymore um, and that figure's rising, and also really startling figure that um, over it's um, five, you, like a woman who misses one year of her pension credits um, will lose out on almost five thousand pounds over the course of her retirement, which is just a whole lot of money that women are missing out on. Um, and I was just wondering if anyone could comment on that, and also whether there's what people know about what Eleanor Rathbone, did she foresee this, uh, sorry, did she um, ask for this link to be for this protection of women's pension rights? Thank you. Thank you very much. I can't answer the question about the pension. She was the campaign on pensions for women, but I'm afraid I don't know very much about it at all. I don't know whether either Jenny or Ruth do. That's not my area of expertise, but I will try and find out for you. Um, just before I move on to Bernard, uh, Selma put a question in the chat box. Oh, Ruth, yes, Ruth. Yeah, a on that, and really important point. Um, uh, I I don't know if Elena Rathbun spoke about it, but I think it was actually the 1970s. It may have been Barbara Castle or someone like that who, who I think, during the 1970s that it was brought in under. Uh, um, uh, during pension reforms, um, but the point about um, that because they they haven't increased the 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 ceiling, the the kind of threshold at which you get hit by this rule since it was introduced, and it was introduced well, oh, I think nearly a decade ago. Of course, it's pulling more and more people into it, and now I mean, originally it was a it was. A, as I think just aimed at higher rate taxpayers, but now it's pulling people well below higher rate tax threshold. So it's really, really good point to remind that, that how important it is that people still claim it, even if it is then taken off um, the, the, on, the, on the tax bill. But it, it's, um, it's something again, that I've tried to raise sometimes in the laws, but you kind of get nowhere, you know? Um, but it, it's it's a really iniquitous rule, and it's not as you've brought out. It's not just kind of in a sense really well-off people who are being hit by it. Selma, can you say something about the 1972 family allowance campaign? That's what we wanted to ask Marie, who was a participant yes. in it. 
Yes, well, um, we heard, we heard uh, that the government was taking child benefit, child, it was family allowance then, was going to put it in the men's pay packet. And we knew, first of all, that women were going to lose the money. But secondly, that the men were not going to get it because if they were on strike, they didn't get a pay packet. And if they were unemployed, they didn't get a pay packet. So the men were also going to lose the family, whatever was the generosity or not of the men, the whole family was going to lose the money. And uh, so I called together some women and they really came quickly and um, they, who were in the women's liberation movement, there were about 30 or 40 of us in the first meeting. And it was only in London because we didn't have, you know, Zoom or anything to be in touch with women in, in other cities. And also many of us didn't, weren't able to afford a telephone. And we did a study. One woman said, I'm going, I know about this and I'm going to, and she took two weeks to do a study of all the implications of women having the family allowance or not. And she came to us at the meeting. There were about 20 or 30 women from London and said, this is how women will lose by it, not have the money. The husband will lose it. Every time there's a strike, she will not have the money in the in the house, and uh, and in every way, the family will be poorer. And so we we organized a number of things, meetings, and spreading the word through spare rib and anywhere that we can get the information out. And then we had a a, a, a campaign. The family allowance day was Tuesday. And we all, wherever we were in the country, we went to the post office and with our petition saying that two things, our demands were two. One, we keep family allowance. We mothers keep family allowance. And two, that family allowance must be paid for the first child, which it still was, had not done. And um, uh, women did sign, and I remember in particular, um, some women in Kilburn, London, where I was petitioning with other women at the post office off the high road. And um, I said, Madam, would you sign our petition? And she said, I don't sign any petition that my husband hasn't read first. And I said, but Madam, they want to take your family allowance. And she looked at me and she said, but this is the only money I can call my own. Where do I sign? <laughs> that was the attitude. And it really confirmed our view that the question of money for women was absolutely crucial to women. That's what they wanted. That's what they needed. And that's what they were ready to fight men for. It was a very big education for a lot of us because the Wages for Housework campaign had just begun. And the debate was on. And I remember another woman from Spare Rib who came to me. She said, well, she knew me. She said, Selma, look, I'm not for family allowance because it's wages for housework and I'm against wages for housework. But I don't think we should allow women to have that money taken from them. So give me an article and I'll put it in Spare Rib. Thank you and so much. And indeed she did. And we really clarified our minds and made contact with grassroots women on the Tuesday of another day. There was another day somewhere in the country where it wasn't on Tuesday, but where it was, they knew that we as feminists, as women's liber, as whatever they considered us, that we were for money for them and they were entirely for that. They believed that that's what we should be fighting for and they were ready to fight. And the thing is the government gave in too quickly. We were building a movement, but um, the, I, I have an idea, I've thought about it a lot and I still meet the women that 30 or 40 years, one woman came into a demonstration game in 
well, was on a demonstration in Liverpool about the uh, uh, saving the women's hospital. And a woman came to me and said, you don't know me, but the last time we saw each other, you were sleeping on my floor. So it, it was a great movement. Thank you, and, Selma. We've got a lot of queer people wanting to ask questions. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but would yeah, you mind? Not at all. Just, not at all. You. That's my story. Bird, would you like to put your question? Uh, it's not a question. It's two okay. comments. And one of them, uh, in fact, Jenny has already raised in the chat, but it's two anecdotes about showing that Eleanor was not forgotten. In the 1980s, I was working for the UN in Africa um, at the UN Center for Human Settlements, which was the agency responsible for UN housing policy. And um, at a meeting in Kenya of this organization, uh, a woman who was a government minister spoke and mentioned Eleanor Rathbone and her work or her speaking against female genital mutilation in Africa, which had been something like 60 years earlier, 50 years earlier. Um, but the other one is probably more important in terms of the conversation that we've been having. I think it was 1988 and we had a conference on housing in India. And as always, the question uh, arose of how is housing to be paid for? Who gets housing? How can you support people who can't afford housing? And the Minister of Housing from Jamaica, and I'm afraid I don't remember her name, but she quoted Eleanor Rathbone and she said work that she had been doing with a group of politicians from across the world on housing policy showed that the only way to ensure that rents got paid if allowances were involved was to make sure that the allowances went to the women. And I thought it was a very interesting comment at the time. And I remember her mentioning Eleanor Rathbone and although I vaguely knew the name, it didn't mean anything. I knew the name because my mum, who had been a politician since 1945, had mentioned her, but I was a very young child and I didn't know what the context was. But I think it's important that her work is now being rediscovered, her contributions are being rediscovered. And I think there are a lot of other people who you will find were equally important in different ways. And I hope that work is going on to rediscover them. And thanks for organizing a fantastic event. Thank you very much. Chrissy, you've got your hand up. Yes, I do. I, I know I'm part of the tech team, but I also wanted to come in on the issue that Kalechi oh, raised. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, because I, I mean, what collection raised was uh, was really important and ties in very much with, uh, I'm sure, Ella and Rathbone's whole, uh, whole philosophy around defending refugees and what um, we now would call asylum seekers, uh, having changed that name, um, because what's happening is, you know, successive governments have really made it a policy to make women, um, particularly women that we work with, destitute. Uh, I work with the Global Women Against Deportations, which consists also of the All African Women's Group, a hundred strong women of uh, women seeking asylum and refugees. And over and over again, they report, you know, the, the, the destitution that is inflicted, you know, is inflicted deliberately on them. And also, you know, the, the, as part of that hostile environment of detention and deportation, you know, so it's really important uh, uh, that we're fighting for the rights of those who are seeking asylum here and are coming here now, uh, who are being pushed back by you know, an ever increasing, I, I, I can't uh, hesitate but to use the word fascism, that's coming from this home office. And so, you know, it's really important to recognize the, the, the value of the work of all that all of us do of producing and caring for each other wherever we are in the world, because a big part of that will mean having to flee war, will mean having to flee 
uh, ecological devastation and seek safety, you know, so that we really are all in the same struggle to fight for that. So when we're fighting against the taking away of benefits from, uh, you know, some of the most vulnerable groups, we're also fighting for ourselves to have those, the same rights to the protection that we all need, uh, you know, because we can see very much what kind of an economic policy is coming down on us, is coming down on us like a train, frankly. And I think it is really good to have the history that we come from connecting with today's struggles, you know, which are very much alive and which are very much part, I think it was Jenny who gave, you know, such a fantastic rounding of the, of the situation we're facing with climate change as well. So, you know, I feel this was a really great uh, webinar to put us into our context and into our history. And thanks to everybody. Thank you very much. Uh, Pete, would you like to put your question if you can unmute? Oh. <laughs> Hello, sorry. Um, my name is... you. <laughs> Hi, my name is Peace. And um, I just wanted to comment. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for everyone. Uh, the speakers, people who organized this event, it was really amazing. And thank you for introducing uh, to us the amazing woman um, listening to the, the work she did. I just can't believe. Um, I started, I just wanted to say quickly, I started getting child benefit when I was an asylum seeker. And I can't start to explain how important that was to me because that meant that my child had food on the table. It meant that she had things that other children had. I mean, when you talk about 20 pounds a week, it sounds like it's so little, but when you collect it, because I remember when I started working now, when I, I, had, when I started working, I started saving that money and that money meant that now my other children had joined me, meant that they had things like computers, they had shoes, they had life that other children were getting. Even right now, my youngest has just turned 18 and I was looking back and I'm thinking, oh my God, this, this, what, this money meant a lot to me and did a lot of things uh, because I saved it. I've never used it for anything. Once I started working, I was strict with it, but it meant that the children were able to get treats and stuff. But now I'm horrified that at the moment, asylum seekers are not getting it. And this is, I, I just can't believe it because it's like uh, taking food from someone's mouth who is hungry. These are the people who need it most, but now these are the people who are not getting it. And that is really unacceptable. And I am wondering if there's a campaign or something going on to try and um, make the government reinstate it. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for that. Um, so Thank you everybody for coming tonight and participating in this launch of the publication. Hello, Leslie. Oh, sorry. May I say another word? Sure. Oh, ah, we thought we'd lost you. <laughs> Back again. Um, I just wanted to say that the, the child benefit has been so much of a mother's life. I'm, I'm a mother of four children and it's been such a crutch to help in life that I think it should be made really a lot more into a, uh, a more permanent, larger amount for women to actually survive on something like a care income who is going to, that's going to be in place for mothers and carers particularly to be able to fulfill the, the work of, of looking after their child or children or um, any other environment that they're living in, that they're caring for the land or, or a neighbor or a family member. I think this child benefit could grow into something much more precious um, for women in the future and their families in the future and, and be paid as a care income um, to completely help with the future of raising the next generation and supporting the mother's work in their care and their 
support of their community and family and the world at large, planet too. Thank you for that. Just before, Leslie, we've, I've got one more uh, question here from a lady in a very nice colour jumper who calls herself iPhone. So I can't. I don't oh, know. that's me. I'm iPhone. Hi, I'm Phoebe Jones. And I, I just wanted to say how inspiring this is. You know, we're finally getting universal child tax credits in the US, um, you know, completely refundable, meaning it can go to everyone for the first time. Um, and we're having to fight to hold on to it. But I feel so reinforced in our fight to make it come to the, to the mother or the primary caregiver, because right now by default, it's going to the main breadwinner. And, you know, hearing Eleanor Rathbone's strong words on that, you know, it's really, uh, it's really inspiring and, and, and inspiring us to, to carry on that fight. And, uh, you know, as she put it, we have a very small baby here that needs nurturing and filling. So, uh, you know, we're gonna help that baby grow. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Leslie, can I go back to you and back to Solvi? Okay, so thank you very much indeed to everybody for coming and participating because it would have been a, hopeless even if you hadn't and I'd like to thank um, Ruth, Jenny, Shoda and Maria and Stephen and Charlotte for their input into this evening's event. The feedback on the chat has been really positive and I really thank you to the technical team for managing it all so fantastically. But speaking personally, it's been a real pleasure to work with Solvig um, from the Crossroads Women on this project over the last few years. And I'm really glad it's finally come to fruition. Thank you very much indeed, everybody, for attending. Thank you. Sorry, Susan, can I just do the, can I just give the last word to Eleanor? Oh, there, of course. Where are you? Oh, you're there. Hello. Yes, right. Okay. <laughs> it's just to it's just to let everybody know. Um, we've talked about the disinherited family a few times. We mentioned the publication um, right at the beginning, and this is what it looks like. Okay, it really is a wonderful book, and the introduction to it is absolutely, you know, also amazing. And I've I've not seen that kind of you know, history um, before, you know, the two together are really great. And I think there's a link in the chat about where you can get the book. Um, and, it, you know, it's definitely very much worth a read to really, you know, understand everything about what she did. And her arguments are still so valid today, as we've heard.